Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Petre. I'm a professor of gender studies at Central European University in Vienna and a member of the standing committee working to erect a monument of victims of sexual violence during wartime. Before I speak about the planned memorial, let me greet all of you in the name of different organizations which made this recording possible, the Flemish representation in Budapest and the Budapest City Archive. It requires a brief explanation. Why do we have this talk today? Hungary is often in international media as a bad example how not to erect monuments and also about the bad aesthetic choices for these new monuments and statues. In 2019, the municipal election, uh, the municipal of Budapest was won uh, by the opposition to the illiberal regime and the new era has started. A resolution was adopted by the General Assembly of the Budapest capital with majority of the opposition to the governing Fidesz party in January 2020 about erecting of the monument to women raped in war in 2022 with an international competition. The decision was a bipartisan decision, which is exemplary fact in a time of forced, often artificial polarization. This process will involve broad historical and artistic expertise and promises a transparent process involving a public debate. The purpose is to create space for dialogue and enabling public participation in memorialization process and creating public art. This is all fine, but how does the Flemish representation come into the picture? Dealing with difficult past and spaces of dark histories is a task for the whole Europe and, of course, globally. When I was a distinguished fellow in München at the Institute für Zeitgeschichte at the Center for Holocaust Studies, I met Verle and I was impressed by the work they are doing. I think the way how they organized the memorialization process together with discussing during the process with the different stakeholders is interesting for a country where museums and monuments grow during night without any discussion with the stakeholders. The project of erecting this monument to the victims of sexual violence during wartime has several parts. The first one is a lecture series in Hungarian, which covers the history and art history of sexual violence during wartime. Parallel, a collection of ego documents and oral history interviews has started at the Budapest City Archive. The recording of past lectures is available on the website. A collection of ever-growing resources is also available on the website kind of mini library. This will be followed by an international workshop to contextualize this discussion in an international context. This discussion, what you see today, will be the first event. When we look around, what can we learn from experiences and practices of the others? This is the moment again to thank you. First of all, to thank the Flemish, Flemish representation in Budapest, especially to Zsuzsa Lénard, who finances this event. Then the Budapest City Archives, which hosts the web page www.lhalgatva, with double L dot H-U. The web page for erecting a memorial for victims of sexual violence during wartime, and especially Katalin Toma. And special thanks to Marty Obbad, who is providing technical support for us today. This recording will be available with Hungarian subtitles at the YouTube channel of the Archive of Budapest, and also on the web page of the project, erecting a memorial of victims of sexual violence during wartime. So let me introduce our guest, Verle, today, who kindly accepted to be our guest, no matter how busy she is during these horrible COVID times. So Verle uh, van den Dalem has a BA and an MA in history from Ghent University, uh, Hand, sorry, Hand University, and a PhD, 2006, from the University of Antwerp. Uh, Maurice de Wilde's documentary series on the Second World War uh, were the subject of her MA thesis. Her PhD work concerned the return and the reconstruction of Jewish life in Antwerp after the Second World War, 1944 and 1960. She had, has held fellowships at the University of Michigan, the Frankel Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies, 2006, and 2008, Jews and the City, and at the University of Pennsylvania, Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, 2008-2009,
the Fellowship Jews, Commerce and Culture. Besides numerous articles, she has authored two books, Images of Women in the Bump Block, uh, it was published in Hand 2002, and later The Construction of the Jewish Community in Antwerp in Amsterdam 2008. Uh, both books are in Flemish. She coordinated the work packages, identification and investigation for the EHRI, which is the European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, at uh, Kazan Dosen. What is this? You will hear later on. Uh, and we are working together in this European Holocaust Research Infrastructure, as I'm the member of the one of the members of the advisory board. She's also affiliated to the University of Antwerp, where she has taught courses on migration history, Jewish history, and other topics. So today she will give a short talk about this project, which impressed me so much. And then we will have a short conversation about the issues which matter, hopefully, not only to both of us. So thank you, Verle. The floor is yours. Thank you. OK, so thank you so much, Andrea. And I'm really happy to be here and to share a presentation about the work we're doing in Mechelen in uh, Belgium. Um, so, because I know that this museum may not be familiar to most of you, I decided to first give you an impression of where we are at and, and why we are there. So, the Dossin barracks <clears throat> during the Second World War uh, were the place from where over 20, 25,000 484 Jews were deported from there and 352 Roma. So it's a lieu de mémoire which commemorates the racial persecution during the Second World War in Belgium. So, and to give you a little bit of a background about Belgium and the Holocaust, because at the museum, obviously, as a lieu de mémoire, we start from this Belgian case. Um, we had a military government during the Second World War, a militaire verwaltung, and that comprised Belgium and the north of France. It was our second occupation after World War I. We had World War II, uh, unlike, for example, our uh, northern neighbors in the Netherlands. Um, the Jewish population in Belgium uh, were mostly 90% non Belgian nationals, and this had to do with the fact that we had a fairly recent immigration of Jews to Belgium and also that uh, the even being born in the country did not make you a Belgian citizen. So there was also a delay for those who had been there for longer, for long periods of time to get the citizenship. Now, the Jewish population was according to estimates, and these are the lower numbers, 60 to 70,000 people, out of which 45% were deported. So this is basically the place we're at, the case we're talking about, and uh, why we do what we're doing. And in this PowerPoint, I give you also a little bit of impressions of A, what the Tosa uh, barracks looked like during the war, during the time of occupation between the summer of 42 and 44, when it was used as a Sammellager, as a gathering place for people to be transported, deported mostly towards, towards Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, I also give an impression of the first memorial museum that was inaugurated there and uh, the building across the street, now the huge building, which was uh, opened in 2012 to accommodate the, uh, the, the needs of the visitors because we had too many visitors in the small museum, so we had to enlarge capacity. So, Caserne d'Ossin, the historical building and the history of the institution. So during the summer of 42, until the summer, until uh, the 4th of September, 1944, with the liberation, it was this SS Samalaga for Jews and Roma. Um, what happened after the war then? So from September 44 till April 46, it was an internment camp for collaborators. From 48 till 75, it was used by the Belgian military, so the Military School for Administration and Finance. And the military left the building after 75. In 77, it became property of the city of Mechelen. And 
um, people did not really know what to do with the building. Should it be demolished? Should it be refurbished? Um, it was not quite clear. In 1984, so after quite some years, followed then the decision to renovate the building and to make it into luxury apartments. Um, that was at the same time the moment where uh, the Jewish community uh, started um, being active in order to not have the full building into apartments, but also to reserve a space in this historical building for commemoration, for a memorial. And so there was uh, uh, one of the apartments was bought and gradually uh, Basically, the front wing of the historical building became the property of what is now Caserne d'Ossin and before this, uh, the Jewish Museum of, on Deportation and Resistance. This uh, first museum was inaugurated in 1995, uh, so 50 years after the liberation of the, of the camps. Uh, and the opening for the public was one year later in 96. Um, I give you some impressions here on uh, the state of the building, uh, having been occupied by the army and, and uh, after all these years, I do not need to tell you that it did not look like what it looked like during the Second World War when it was a, this gathering camp. So um, the, the, the walls and the, the, the building itself is the historical building, but on the inside there was little that remained from, to nothing that remained from the wartime period. So the idea was to make a memorial um, and from 94 till 96, uh, Maxim Steinberg and Laurent Schramm started gathering uh, information and making copies to open this memorial, but it actually became larger. And it was not just a memorial, it also became a museum with a clear educational mission to kind of um, bring this message, bring this history to primarily uh, school children, uh, youngsters in uh, um, uh, secondary school, high school. So, um, and gradually, because of all this looking for information for a museum and a memorial, uh, the survivors or those who held historical documents started donating them to, the, to this project. And it became not only a memorial and a museum, it also became a documentation center. And then there was more and more research that was being done on this case. And so right now we're even also a research center. So um, the visitors, when this museum opened in 96, which was a small museum, because since it was, the building was divided in apartments, the museum was one apartment basically, and the, the basement. So, um, so but the, the, the visitors came in large numbers. We had so many uh, high school students coming that we uh, reached really max capacity. The 90s were also the, the time, the second half of the 90s, where the extreme right in Flanders, the Vlaams Bloc, uh, uh, gained electoral importance. And so uh, Patrick de Waal suggested to invest into a Flemish Holocaust Museum in 2000. And that led to an enlargement of the project of the Jewish Museum on Deportation and Resistance to what is currently Caserne d'Ossin and with the enlarged capacity and the big building to accommodate the visitors. When the Flemish government did this, this was clearly with a goal to learn from the past and reflect on the present to kind of hopefully shape the future in, in, the, in, in a good direction. And so in 2012, in December, Caserne d'Ossin opened the new permanent exhibition in the new building across from the historical site and the old museum space became the memorial to, for the commemoration and for honoring uh, the, the victims who had been deported, who had been victim of racial persecution during the Second World War. And we started, uh, we continued all this time to um, document this Belgian case 
of the Holocaust in our documentation and research center, uh, which we uh, for which we have a reading room now. We have a catalog online, a build bank. We have a million uh, over one and a half million, one point six million of digitized documents that are accessible for researchers, for families who are looking into the history of their loved ones, uh, and so on and so forth. And in the museum, uh, we make the link with human rights and the Holocaust. Because when we became Caserne de Saint, the name was Caserne de Saint Memorial Museum and Documentation Center on Holocaust and human rights. So it really wanted to make that bridge uh, from the historical past to human rights in general. It wanted to also make that uh, bridge between past, present and future, uh, also with information and with the programs that we're bringing. So when one visits the memorial in, in the historical building, it's all about the victims and commemorating and providing a, 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 a serene spot for mourning and for contemplation and for um, thinking about what happened back then. Uh, but in the museum, uh, we make the link with other human rights violations and our educational programs are also there to enhance the respect of human rights and, and install that in, in, into our visitors' experiences. So when you see uh, in this photo, uh, on the one hand, a commemoration wall with the victims of the Shoah of, of all those that have been deported from the Dossin barracks, you also see that we make the link in every floor of our um, museum with human rights violations in other places and at other times. Um, so that people reflect about this, that they reflect about uh, not only other genocides, but also about discrimination, exclusion, migration and all the challenges that come with this. We have a very thorough education uh, uh, um, offer that we offer not only to high school students, as we always did, also in the predecessor of Casano Dossin, uh, but also towards um, um, people who want to learn something during their free time, both adults and youngsters. So we even have a uh, family program, visits for families with young children that we uh, want to make possible so that um, everybody can come and learn about the past and make this connection with human rights today and tomorrow. And one of the uh, special groups that we also um, um, have as, as part of our uh, adult learners uh, is uh, the police forces. We also have programs for magistrates. And uh, the program Connecting Law and Memory was one of the programs that we did um, specifically for making these connections between uh, current police forces, um, magistrates and others. Uh, what can be learned from the Holocaust how can things be learned and uh, how do we reflect about how we act today uh, and tomorrow? And uh, there's on the one hand this connecting law and memory, but we also have Holocaust police and, uh, um, uh, and memory program. Uh, and there this HPM program uh, brings policemen into the museum to... Um, visit the museum to learn what police forces did uh, during the Second World War, during the racial persecution. But then in the afternoon, once they've learned the mechanisms of what happened during the Second World War, they will reflect on real-time cases from the police experiences today on how they can deal with the challenges that they are faced with today in their daily uh, professional life. So basically, as a memorial, a museum, and a research center, we want to be a civic connector. We want to connect 
uh, the past, the history with society today, and uh, and and make that happen. And so, for example, the next upcoming temporary exhibition that we are uh, going to have uh, starting this December is called Hashtag Fake Images, uh, Unmask the Danger of Stereotypes. And this is an exhibition with both uh, the historical part of why we are doing what we're doing by developing um, the history of anti-Semitism, uh, mostly focusing on the end of the 19th century and until the Second World War, Second World War included, how that anti-Semitic stereotypes, how they developed, how this uh, gradually led to um, the Jewish population being stigmatized and eventually led to a genocide, um, then uh, we want to uh, make the we want to explain to the audiences how how is it that you're that we are uh, so uh, sensible to, to to stereotypes? How how do we how how is how is it possible that we think in this kind of um, categories and and how? How can we actually be more aware of this and uh, react to it so that it does not uh, um, have uh, the same effect as what we've seen where it went wrong in the past? Uh, so we really want to bridge uh, the historical knowledge, the mechanisms that we can see there and bring them in, uh, in today's world. Uh, so that people can learn from the past, that they can understand how things happened, but that it also helps people to um, discover mechanisms and be more aware of things going on today. So I think that gives in a nutshell an idea of where we are and why we do what we do. Thank you very much. Uh, so my first question is uh, uh, about the relationship with the Jewish community, because you pointed out that they were those who were actually initiating this uh, kind of memorialization process. So if you can give some insights about this process, how it happened and who were the main stakeholders and uh, uh, what, how, how this actually happened. Okay. So um, the Jewish community, uh, is and that, that speaks for itself very very involved and 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 very concerned about how this commemoration and uh, all our activities how that takes place uh, so there have been commemorative events held in front of the building uh, since the post-war period so an annual pelerinage if you if you can call it like this. Uh, which still takes place until today. Uh, the Jewish Museum on Deportation and Resistance was founded by, uh, it, was, it, it grew from an initiative from the Consistoire and then became its own uh, organization. Uh, so the board members there are representatives of the Jewish community uh, mostly. Um, when Caserne d'Ossin, uh, when, and maybe it's also important that I mention then that the Flemish government has supported their endeavors. So from very early on, there was support from the from the Flemish government, also from the province of Antwerp, from the from the city of Mechelen. So there was support, but there was also um, donations from the Jewish community to make this happen from different individuals, from certain foundations within the Jewish community, because this is obviously very, very important to the Jewish community, uh, to the victim communities in general, because we also have the Roma uh, victims. Um, when Caserne d'Ossin was founded, this is when the Flemish government uh, really invested uh, as a very significant amount in erecting this new building and uh, allowing this museum to grow and to expand uh, in order to, to really make uh, the educational mission happen. Uh, at that time, uh, the uh, board of Caserne d'Ossin has been... Uh, 
uh, put together with uh, 15 members, out of which there were um, seven members who were uh, representatives from this former museum from the board of the Jewish Museum. Uh, there were uh, furthermore six members indicated by the Flemish government, one from the province of Antwerp and one from the city of Mechelen. So basically you have a bit of a 50-50 representation in the board um, to ensure that the concerns of the Jewish community are addressed. And at the same time, you also have the uh, the uh, input of the Flemish government who really, really uh, wanted to um, make a case for uh, also opening up uh, the historical case of the Holocaust by making this clear, explicit connection with human rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that this uh, site was also a site for internment camp after the Second World War. So what are the key uh, kind of touchy, thorny points of uh, history of the uh, Belgian collaboration during the Second World War? And is that somehow addressed in the, uh, in the exhibition or in this uh, whole uh, uh, complex uh, educational research and, uh, uh, and exhibition space? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in our exhibition, the, there is attention for the post-war trials concerning this part of the, of the, of the war. So uh, the, the racial persecution, um, because the ones who were interned in the barracks were not necessarily uh, interned there for uh, that reason. Um, and Belgium has had a difficult uh, um, dealing with its post-war trials and the... Um, uh, how collaborators were dealt with. Uh, it remains a very sensitive topic in public discourse. Um, what we are bringing in is is mostly um, those those uh, those informations that give you an idea of how how did people become perpetrators what was their background what did they do um what what leads people to do these atrocities um what makes you compliant what makes you what makes you uh, do these things and are you crazy or totally um is there something like psych psychologically not right in your head or can any person in certain circumstances be led to do these type of things. So rather than focusing on, on the collaboration and, and the post-war history of how Belgium dealt with that in general, which is a huge topic on its own and is being dealt with in detail by, by, by others, we focus mostly on, on um, yeah, perpetrators, bystanders, victims, and how the mechanisms work and what we can tell about this for the historical, for the historical case. So. But, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic building and uh, uh, what is the role of art and artists? Are you collaborating with artists or local artists or international artists when you think about how to make the messages of the past accessible for the present? generation which is very different than uh, the previous generation yeah so um uh, we we do have uh, art in in the in caserne d'ossin uh it was part also of the setup so we have uh the sculptures of uh, philippe aguirre uh one of them is in the memorial building and uh, there was one image in, in the powerpoint about uh, uh, a, a, a statue a, a sculpture he made about the roundups in um in antwerp in the summer of 42 um and he has another um sculpture in the museum of a man standing uh next to a wall uh, facing a wall um so and then we have uh, a couple of other sculptures but all in 
other than that, in the permanent exhibition, it's mostly about the historical uh, stories. But during our temporary exhibitions, we can bring in other other artworks, uh, other um, evocations of um, human rights or human rights violations. So we've had several um, temporary exhibitions that involved art. We had uh, um, an exhibition, I'd have to... Um, look up the, the name so that I don't make any, any mistakes there. We've had uh, Daniel Hernandez, uh, uh, which was uh, on Guatemala, uh, with, with uh, I can show it like so maybe. Um, I don't know whether that helps to see it. Uh, what, what you do when you see human rights violations, you see, you hear, uh, so you don't want, you, you don't, you don't say something, you don't see it, you do, you don't hear it, but you actually should be should be shouting it out. Um, we also had um, uh, an exhibition, a temporary exhibition on the art of war, um, in which we brought in etches from uh, uh, various artists, but including Otto Dix and uh, and and. and Rose, uh, evoking the horrors of the First World War. Um, and we had people uh, react on that. Change makers of today uh, reacted on those works and what they did, what that, how that felt to them. So that was very interesting as well. We also um, hosted the exhibition that our colleagues at Memorial de la Shoah made on uh, Holocaust and comic strips. Uh, so another type of art to bring in uh, the, the past, bring in the Holocaust, but also other genocides and other um, places. So, so that has been there as well. So yes, there's, there's various ways to kind of reach out and to, um, to, to make that connection. And I'm sure other temporary exhibitions will follow along those lines. And my last question is about the general political climate, because you have uh, written a book about Flambok and uh, so this particular uh, far right party. And I was wondering how this and you also mentioned that the museum was a kind of reaction to this uh, surprising uh, victory of the uh, Flambok uh, at a certain point in the Belgian history. So you as an expert of this party and also as a person who is uh, running this very impressive museum. So how can you uh, uh, characterize uh, the relationship uh, between this uh, uh, rise of the extreme right and the museum? So do you think that this museum is really helpful in uh, fighting and changing people's mind? Or is this just a reaction? Or is it a creative response? Or uh, so how do you see this, um, uh, the role of this Caserne um, uh, uh, in this present uh, political climate in Belgium? Mm -hmm. Well, um, needless to say, we, we definitely hope to uh, be an advocate for um, mutual understanding for dialogue and for inclusivity and so we hope to contribute to a world without racism without discrimination and in that sense we definitely are are on the barricades to to make that happen in today's world and whether whether we make a difference or not um the thing that so many uh, school groups come and visit us that we have so many people who during their free time come and visit us and see these things uh makes us definitely hopeful that something will stay with them and that that are uh, we're not going to tell people what to do. What we hope is that people, by seeing what we're doing, will start making their own reflections and make up their own mind. Because if then um, attitudes change, it will be a change that people have made themselves. And we had, uh, for the police program that I mentioned, we had a, a research being carried out by the VUB, the Free University of Brussels, 
uh, to measure whether we had impact with what we were doing in the program for the police forces. And so there uh, we noticed that um, there was impact, there was significant impact. So coming to the museum, following the 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 whole program, including the visit to the permanent exhibition, the historical part, dealing with uh, the use cases, uh, the challenges of today, um, that it made it that it made a difference. That people uh, into their daily lives, into their professional practice, which is really reassuring and very very nice to hear and to see. Uh, so so. I think by by explaining mechanisms and by inviting people to reflect themselves and to to uh, take steps of their own, that that is of key importance. And it's a challenge with museums like ours because you're dealing with a past and a history that is so awful and so horrible and so unimaginable that people might also shut down and think that it's too much. So what we're trying to offer to our visitors is the fact that most most people always have a choice uh, in how they react to something and that there are people who have stood up in the past and that they can inspire us to stand up today and that you do not need to be the president or the king of a country or the head of the military troops to make that difference, that each and every one of us can make that difference within their own area of possibilities. If you're a toddler or a, a primary school kid and you give your... your um, your toys to a little uh, Jewish boy in hiding during the Second World War, then you made a tremendous difference. Uh, so, so you can you can you can relate to that in every in every possible way. On um, what what can you actually do? And and uh, every contribution helps. You know, even if you cannot stop or change the world solo. Uh, it still makes such a difference if we all make that little contribution and that little step in the uh, activity zone or in the, the range that it's ours and that we can react to, then, then that could make a huge difference if you put all those little things together. Thank you very much, Verla. This was a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. <laughs> and uh, congratulations on your work. And I hope we will continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.